My name is Ben Harmon Jones. I'm a medical doctor. Um, I actually trained here in Manchester um, before going to work as a junior doctor. Um, and I wanted to talk to you today about the millennial healthcare professional. It's a term we've heard a lot about today. Um, and what I want to talk to you about is the way that millennial healthcare professionals are redefining what it really means to be an expert clinically. So I trained for five years to be a doctor. Um, over that time, I was exposed to a massive amount of data. I learned about diseases. I learned about the body. I learned about the anatomy of the body, how it's structured. I learned about the way it works normally, physiology, the normal physiological processes that make us tick over and keep us well. I learned about how it goes wrong. I learned about diseases and the various points in those pathways that when they do go wrong, can make us ill. I learned about how to communicate with patients. I talked to actors and learned what patients really want to know. I learned about life saving protocols, how to save a patient's life in a split second. I learned how to perform procedures. It's a massive amount of data to know, and I was expected to know all of it. I learned using a variety of means. I attended lectures where data was thrown at me, visually and verbally. I um, went to weekly discussion groups where we talked through cases we'd seen and talked about different ideas we had about them. Um, I dissected cadavers and went to post-mortems to learn about anatomy. Um, I, like I said, talked to actors and tried out different communication techniques with them to see what works and what doesn't work in a safe, simulated environment. Um, I learned in simulated settings where we'd have simulated bodies and simulated patients and we'd try out resuscitation scenarios so that we could practice in our own time before we faced it for real. I learned how hospitals work and are managed. It's a massive amount of information and I was expected to know all of it. It's all really important stuff to know but unfortunately you can't just chuck all of that information in and expect you, someone to remember that. It doesn't work like that unfortunately. Someone once said to me that I should approach this problem by aiming to have a thin layer of knowledge about everything. So not know anything in too much depth, like a specialist would, but have a broad width of knowledge, a little bit about everything. Thin crust on the top of everything. That's well and good. It's a good theory, but the problem is, what do you put in that thin crust? You know, how do you know what the next patient you go and see is going to have how do you know what the next emergency you're going to see? How it's going to present itself? How do you know that? How do you know what to put in that thin crust of information? This is the first problem. It's knowing what to know. That's the first problem. So I learned how to be a doctor, and then I went and did it. I went and put it into practice. <coughs> um, so being a doctor is totally different to being a medical student. Um, there are many, many things that you don't learn as a medical student that you have to learn on the job for real. And the only way of learning that is actually going and doing it. Um, it's a totally different ball game when you're actually doing something for real as opposed to practice. When you actually have to go to someone for the first time and tell someone's husband that their wife's just died. When you go to someone and you tell someone's daughter that their dad's just had a stroke. Nothing can really prepare you for doing that. And you just have to go and do it. And there's a part that you can never train for in doing that. So there's a lot to know, and it's a very steep learning curve. The problem with that is that all these challenges are thrown at you randomly. It's not like medical school, where things are nicely compartmentalized into different sections and topics. It's all just chucked at you randomly. And you're there, often on your own, expected to manage all of it and, it and do it well because people are looking to you to do it well. The big problem with this is time. Um, as we've heard already, healthcare is a hugely time-pressured environment to work in. There are massive, massive constraints on the resources of not just doctors but every professional who works in both a hospital and primary care setting. Not having enough time is the big restraint that everyone faces in this industry. 
And it's really a problem because often what you will see is people going off what I call um, clinical experience. They'll go and see a patient and they'll make a decision based on what they've done a hundred times before. And they've done safely a hundred times before. And they'll use what their clinical acumen and clinical experience tells them to do and is safe. It's all well and good, but it's not often what's best for that patient. It's not often what's based on the evidence that you should do in that specific scenario because there's so much to know. It's not best because we're fallible beings and our brains are amazing at forgetting stuff and making things up when they're not there and making up constructs and concepts and twisting them since we learnt them. Often we don't revisit ideas for 10 or 15 years since we learned them at medical school, some doctors. And if we don't do that, then our brains twist the facts and we start to think that things are true that they're not. And that introduces the chance for error and mistake. And mistakes happen all the time clinically. We hear about some of the most serious ones, but the vast majority we don't hear about. And this is a real, real problem. And a lot of it is driven by not having enough time. But something's really happened over the last few years, which has really changed, changed and is changing the way that people think about doing this. Um, and that is the smartphone, essentially. Um, and in my experience, this little bit of kit has been absolutely invaluable in clinical practice, on the ground clinical practice. It's so useful because we've had this information forever. We've had it in books, in journal articles, online, in paper guidelines. It's all just been lying around, you know, scattered around. And we, we've all known about it. We all know what the right, you know, guidelines and protocols to look at are. But when you actually go and see a patient or you're in a very stressful, time-pressured situation, often you don't have the time to go and look, look at that guideline, look at that article, look at that bit of evidence, because it takes far too long. And what you end up doing is you end up going <coughs> off clinical experience and using what you know is safe, but y not what might be specifically tailored for that patient at that particular point in time. To me, this the way that MHCPs are using this kind of approach falls into three categories. They're using it to remind them of things they already know. All doctors are trained to use um, cardiac arrest algorithms for patients who have gone into an arrest, and they then go into a almost pre-programmed series of steps because you practice it that often. But often when you translate that from theory into practice, error gets introduced because there's never enough equipment and the right people are never there. So things always go wrong. And it's no one's fault, it's just the unpredictability of the real world. The Resuscitation Council UK, who manages this process in this country, um, recently released an app called iResus, um, which is a smartphone app that takes you through the various steps in the protocol that you're supposed to follow. And a randomised controlled trial actually showed that, so they took a group of doctors that had access to a phone with the app on. They took a group of doctors who didn't. They, were both, they both had equal training in this protocol and they, both su they subjected them both to a simulated scenario where they were faced with an identical cardiac arrest situation. And the doctors who had the phone performed significantly better than those who didn't. And it just goes to show the real power that things like this have. MHCPs are using this to inform them about things they know as well. So we've heard a lot about, you know, in this country, doctors use the British National Formulary, a book of all the drugs that are prescribable, dosing, side effects, indication. You carry it around on your phone. No longer do you have to go back to somewhere else, pick a book up, find the page. It's right there in your hand. Doctors are using it to advise them as well, and I think this is particularly interesting. People like NICE, have brought out apps that give you every guideline they've ever produced right in your hand. There's an app called the Mersey Burns app, which was developed by an ex-army medic, where you can actually draw on the pattern of burn on a patient and it will advise you on the rate and type of fluid to give to resuscitate that patient appropriately. That app's actually regulated in the UK as a medical device by the MHRA. And I think it really goes to show just how much traction these kinds of things are getting now. So. I think it's really important to consider that the way that we think about the way doctors work of old is really 
changing. And the kind of millennial healthcare professionals that are coming through the ranks now think about this totally differently. And if you asked me to go on call without a phone, I would look at you in horror because really this is how I have built you know, the way that I think about clinical practice. It's a way of knowing that you're right every time. It's a way of knowing that you're doing what's best for that patient in that specific scenario every time, rather than not guessing, but going off what you think is best. It reminds me of what Steve Jobs famously said about tools and computers. Um, and I'll read this quote to you, because it's quite long. But I think it really demonstrates well what I'm trying to say. He said, I read a study that measured the efficiency of locomotion for various species on the planet. The condor used the least energy to move a kilometer. Humans came in with a rather unimpressive showing about a third, a third of the way down the list. It was not too proud a showing for the crown of creation. So that didn't look so good. But then somebody at Scientific American had the insight to test the efficiency of locomotion for a man on a bicycle. And then a man on a bicycle blew the condor away, completely off the top of the charts. That's what a computer is to me. It's the most remarkable tool that we've ever come up with, and it's the equivalent of a bicycle for our minds. The smartphone is the MHCP's bicycle. It's a tool that we can use to improve ourselves and improve our weaknesses. But for me, this is really only the beginning of what this kind of technology can do for us. The power going forward will really lie in big data. What we've done with computers up to now is we've given them rules about how to analyze data. We've given them code and guidelines on how to look at a piece of data and pull out conclusions. But that analytical process is fundamentally limited by the human that programs that computer. What if you can turn that process on its head? What if you can, instead of telling a computer what to do, what to analyze, what if you can throw it the data and say, you make sense of it, you make the rules. And the power that we've got in computers now is able to do that. And we'll be able to do that more and more and more. What insights could that give us into disease areas, therapy areas? How could that change the definition of what it means to be a healthcare professional? If you think about the huge amount of data in the human genome, it's the biggest amount of data that we know. What could applying that approach do when you apply it to a body of data that big? What insights could it give us? What insights could it give us to help us help people develop new drugs, develop new therapy areas, improve our understanding of disease? I fundamentally believe that this technology really will help us to redefine what it means to be a doctor, what it means to be a pharmacist, what it means to be any healthcare professional. And I think that going forward, this is really, really exciting. Thank you.